Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> Welcome to another UCL Research Expose. Today, we have a photonic theme, and we have a video expanding on the topic of light and how it's useful in viewing exoplanets. Um, so I'm Dr. Laura McCamish. I got my PhD in September 2014, and I'm a postdoc now in the Exomol Research Group at University College Physics and Astronomy Department. And I'm loving my job, my team's fantastic. And what we do is we look at molecules and try to find what colours of light the molecule absorbs. Okay. Which is pretty, gives us pretty awesome information about all sorts of things, including exoplanets, which are planets around stars other than our own star. Light is emitted by most normal matter in the universe. As we know, stars like our sun emit light. In fact, our sun and all stars, in fact, are a very special type of emitter known as a black body radiator. Stars also emit this radiation in every colour. As we know, our sun appears white due to this mixture of all the colours of the spectrum. However, most bodies are not black bodies. In general, they will absorb some light from a star or some other celestial body and then emit the light at certain allowed transitions or allowed wavelengths. These transitions are dictated by the rules of quantum mechanics, and we call this phenomena quantization. For example, me and you are actually glowing right now. It's just that the light that humans emit is actually in the infrared part of the spectrum, and so we can't view it unless we have some sort of special camera. So, for example, if you saw a bright red out in interstellar space, that might be characteristic of hydrogen, the spectrum of which is here. Another characteristic spectrum is that nitrogen here. And as you can see, they have quite stark differences, allowing scientists like us to tell the difference between different elements at really quite astronomical distances. One of the ways in which we can identify an element and pick out its particular spectrum is through an optical spectrometer a simple variant of which we have here. This is a very small diffraction grating built into a sort of telescope lens. And if I look through this at, for example, the light above me, I see the characteristic line spectrum of sodium, the, the element of which the light filament is made. Of course, these are two quite simple ones, the hydrogen and nitrogen spectrum. However, we do eventually go up to quite complex spectrum, such as this which could be some unknown complex molecule out on a faraway exoplanet. This fact that different things will emit specific wavelengths of light allows scientists to detect and analyse light and be able to tell exactly what the thing is that emitted it. We commonly use this when trying to identify an unknown chemical. The experimental effort that many scientists have put in to classify and detect which light is absorbed and emitted by different chemicals has proved incredibly useful throughout recent years. Carbon dating, precise laser operation, identifying impurities and developing new inks and paints are just some of the benefits. However, the UCL-based research group ExoMol has some truly out-of-this-world uses for accurate spectroscopic data. So the main focus of our group is actually calculating line lists, which is spectroscopic data, for molecules that are present in exoplanets. So hot Jupiters, super-Earths, other cool planets that are out there. Light travels in straight lines through space. So as long as it isn't interrupted by absorption, diffraction or reflection, it effectively just keeps on going. This allows us to detect light from very, very far away. This could mean many light years away even. So different molecules have different energy levels um, according to quantum mechanics and our okay. Schrodinger equation up there. Um, and when we solve the electronic and nuclear Schrodinger equations, we can find the energy levels in those molecules. 
ExoMol has been set up to provide an accurate, comprehensive database for spectroscopic data of astrophysical importance. Their aim is to use this data in collaboration with astrophysicists in order to detect and categorize exoplanets. One of the most exciting things about exoplanets is that we've only known about them for around 20 years. This means that the work ExoMol is doing is truly on the frontier of science. The first exoplanet was discovered 21 years ago now, so 1995, and it was a hot Jupiter, so basically imagine Jupiter and bring it really close to the sun, like Mercury distance from the sun, and you get a big ball of gas that's really, really hot and that's called a hot Jupiter and they're the easiest to detect because most of the detections happen by the influence of the planet on the star. So when the planet's going around the star you might be able to see a transit, so the planet is blocking the light from the star or you might be able to see the star move a little bit, so hot Jupiters are always easier to see. Of course, the possibility of exoplanets in abundance also increases the likelihood of finding the so-called Earth-like planet. There's about 2,000 to 3,000 exoplanets that have been okay. discovered so far, That's fine. and the data says that basically every star has planets around it. This means the possibility of alien life. So there's actually a lot of research done on this particular topic, so the topic of how you use the atmosphere composition to detect life on a planet. They're called biomarkers and water is the first thing we look for, but water doesn't uniquely tell us if there's life. Carbon dioxide is also useful, again, doesn't tell us whether there's life or not. Oxygen is a good biosignature in some cases, O2. So, for example, an alien civilization looking at us would be able to tell if they had good enough technology that we existed. Um, O2 shouldn't exist in equilibrium around our planet. CFCs, yeah, yeah. fluorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons, so they're the gases that produce the ozone hole. Mm. They can only really be produced by industrial societies, so therefore pollutants might actually be the way that we find aliens. The best thing we can do is look, is look at atmospheres mm. and then see what we get right. and see whether what the atmospheres are made out of can be produced naturally. It's, it's about what the interesting science is. Yeah. So when it comes to detection of planets, the big hot stuff is detecting new Earth-like planets. Yeah. Whereas for spectroscopic studies, which are much more difficult, there we're only looking at hot Jupiters really at the moment. An example of ExoMol's super accurate spectra data includes that for HCN, hydrogen cyanide, which was recently used to identify the super Earth meaning twice the volume and eight times the mass of Earth, called 55 Cancri E, just this year. This is the first time that scientists have been able to pick out the complex spectral fingerprints of specific gases in a super-Earth's atmosphere so precisely. But how does ExoMol produce such accurate data? There are largely two general methods to predict a molecule's optical spectrum. The first is where we make some largely general approximations about how the molecule behaves. This could be with regards to its rotation or vibration, for example. We then calculate rough spectra from these general approximations and compare them to experimental data here on Earth. One might call this a heuristic approach. The other method that ExoMol prefers to use when it can, is an ab initio calculation. This is Latin for from the beginning, meaning that these calculations are done based on general axioms or fundamental laws of nature. The frequencies of light that a particular molecule absorbs are normally best measured in the lab, whereas the intensity of the transition is actually very hard to measure in the lab and you're much, much better off using theoretical methods. Exomol as a group has developed a procedure by which we get the spectroscopic data. And it's quite a systematic procedure and a lot more grounded in physics and chemistry and quantum mechanics than the methods that were often used previously. 
So we actually often use ab initio data, so that's from first principles, to calculate things like electronic energy levels, vibrational energy levels. So there's this whole bunch of computer programs that we use that calculate from the Schrodinger equation, basic principles, energy levels and transitions. And then the key is that we actually use all the experimental data that we can find and adapt our theoretical models. So my name is Tom Rivlin. I'm a PhD student at the Exmoor Group. Uh, I actually work on a slightly different problem. I work on a, a molecular scattering problem. So what we do is we always, with our simulation, try and get observables out of it. So in our case, the observable might be the uh, scattering cross-section. The specific quirks of how the, the laws of quantum mechanics tell you these particles interact can cause all sorts of unexpected things to happen. However, these quantum mechanical systems involve some fiercely difficult mathematics, and so we use supercomputers to help solve them. So we, we, we're heavily dependent on computers to do theoretical work these days, especially this sort of thing. Uh, when I say I'm a theorist, you could also equally say I'm a computational physicist. Um, what I'm doing is I'm implementing theoretical equations and I'm doing that on a computer and getting computers to do the kind of the numerical work. What usually happens is you write a you write the code to do it, to do it and then you let it go on a like a regular old laptop or something and you let it kind of just to test it out. And then once you're certainly confident that it's working, you can then ask permission to go into the supercomputer and then the supercomputer can um, do more accurate simulations, can simulate over longer timescales, simulate um, with more inputs uh, simultaneously, and then the supercomputer results generally can be better than what you can get on your laptop. Even with some of the most powerful processing machines at our disposal, the researchers at ExoMol will try and limit the number of points that they plot, such that they can produce a smooth, accurate curve. So when you input your parameters into the code like on your laptop, you say, okay, she's use a thousand points to simulate this thing. When you put a supercomputer, you can say, okay, put a million points in, and it'll be more than that even. Um, and it'll, um, because, of, because the supercomputer is much more powerful, it can handle much bigger inputs like that in, in that kind of way, uh, and produce results in like a reasonable amount of time, so like six hours as opposed to like 60 years. Yeah. We are talking about those kinds of time scales, like um, there are certain programs waiting around the laptop we've been talking decades, and not just computer hours. Scientists from all over the globe will then use this amazing collection here at ExoMol in their own projects to verify or discover unknown chemicals. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still doing simulations, I'm still working with computers using fundamental laws of quantum mechanics to simulate what happens. Uh, so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm looking at what happens when two atoms collide with each other, scatter off each other. And the connection actually to do ExoMol is the really accurate energy levels for the molecules, and I need to know like their, what the wave functions look like. And that kind of information is also needed by ExoMol, so they develop some very sophisticated codes to be able to work those kinds of things out. Another UCL mission, Twinkle will use this data in conjunction with a satellite telescope orbiting the Earth in order to glean more information about our universe and to continue the hunt for curious exoplanets. One advantage I have as a um, theoretical computational chemist slash physicist is to do my experiments I need people, so PhD students or postdocs, and I need computer time, and that to be honest is not that expensive. For astronomers to do their job, they need a big telescope. So, for example, the one coming up in 2018 um, from NASA and the um, European Space Agency is called the James Webb Space Telescope, and that cost it $10 billion, so about £5 billion. That's a lot more expensive than it costs to pay me to do my work. And so what we're trying to do um, at UCL, and also wider in the UK, is to launch a satellite called Twinkle, which is a reasonably small satellite, quick, sat quick launch, so we're trying to launch it in three years, and it's going to look at exoplanet atmospheres through transit spectroscopy. With every new discovery, it seems more and more likely that there is some sort of alien life somewhere out there in the universe. And many are now in agreement it won't be too long before we find an exoplanet not too dissimilar from our own. Oh.
probably 30 years we'll find something that looks like a biosignature and then we'll spend at least the rest of my life arguing over whether or not it's a biosignature. So, I mean, I'm an endless optimist in this sort of thing um, and I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Uh, I would say I'd be um, exceedingly surprised if within my lifetime we did not have some kind of fairly definitive looking evidence that um, that was like other in some form or another. Uh, I'd also be very disappointed, of course, but uh, mostly surprised, I think. I think it's, it's only around time for okay. um, Just like when we, um, in the 1970s, they sent a probe to Mars and said, if we get this result, then we will say that there's life on Mars. They got that positive result and then promptly found about 10 different ways that it could have been caused by other things. So we're still trying to find life on Mars. But I think we'll have evidence in 30 years. Fund it.